Welcome to another episode of Flashback Tracks from the Past, the show that takes you back to the golden age of the tracked music scene. Shiver me timbers, it's a new name for the podcast. And today we talk about pirates. A pirate I was meant to be. No ships, no cutlass, and no beer swilling on the tavern. It's all about those pesky software pirates and the lamers who love them.
beat of osmosis, celestial fantasia. So, why are those that copy commercial software without permission called pirates to begin with? Uh, it has nothing to do with crimes on the seven seas. Actually, it relates to the pirate radio stations of the 50s and 60s. Those stations were often located on ships broadcasting from international water where the law of the countries they were targeting would not apply. When the kids in the schoolyards of the 80s started copying diskettes with commercial games, the term was simply reused. But a pirate generally does not refer to the end user, but actually to the cracker and the distributors. Let's talk more about that after a relaxing tracked tune.
Norwegian artist Xerxes and Marie. Let's talk piracy in Sweden. I once interviewed Pontus Berg, or Bacchus, as he's called, in the cracker group Fairlight. He explained that in the first years when Fairlight existed, distribution of commercial software without the copyright owner's consent was actually legal. But uh, diskettes with commercial games and applications were protected in order to make copying impossible. Groups such as Fairlight and Triad here in Sweden disabled this protection and also distributed the software. The industry initially begged them to stop, but when it became illegal, the attitude changed pretty quickly. of sanity, stardust memories. In the early 90s, a lot of us geeks read the Swedish computer magazine Dator Magazine. 
Issue number 16 of 1993 spread shockwaves through the community as Jan Svensson entered the scene. That was not his name, but he did, in fact, exist. A pirate hunter that preyed on those copying discs. There was just a problem. This was not true. The article was kinda open about the true purpose of him, but the picture and the headline made a lot of people believe that he targeted teenagers copying discs with each other. In reality, he actually tried to gather evidence to convict big bulletin board systems selling illegal copies. Okay, that's Skaven 252 and the Goblin Returns. Yes, it is a sequel to Catch That Goblin, the classic Amiga mod tune. John Svensson was described as a former big-time pirate, turned informer belonging to Simp, a precursor to the Swedish organization Antipiratbyrån. And in 1993, his work may have helped bringing down a big BBS in the Swedish town of Helsingborg. The sysop for the BBS called Scandinavia was convicted and had to pay 8,000 Swedish kronas. This is about $1,300 in today's monetary value. The thing that made them target him was that he charged money yearly for access to the pirate copies on his BBS.
Berlin. P.S. Deep Fantasy. So, why did we copy diskettes? For me and many in my situation, we could simply not afford the games as we were teenagers or even kids. But that's of course not a valid legal reason, so I don't offer it as an excuse, rather an explanation. When I got my first modem, I actually didn't pirate much at all, and pretty quickly stopped, as I didn't really care about the games and saved money to buy software instead. Not so much just an ethical decision, but much more that I disliked the wares communities and their high-brow camaraderie and self-absorbed attitude. I respect the crackers, though.
Danville, Path to Nowhere. The Ware's BBSs were the places where you could get the newest cracks. That is, the latest games and apps with the copy protection disabled. The word Elite is often described by the number combination 1337 and comes from the same bunch of people that saw themselves as the best of the best. But they were often shunned by many others. The Wares BBSs required that you were recommended by others in the Wares scene in order to gain access. This protected them from the law, <laughs> or so they thought, and made them feel special. <laughs> No one has better described the Wares dudes than the legendary programmer Eric S. Raymond. The Cracker dudes have a gift culture which thrives in the same electronic media as of the hackers, but their behavior is very different. The group mentality in their culture is much stronger and more exclusive than among hackers. They hoard secrets rather than sharing them. One is more likely to find cracker groups distributing sourceless executables that crack software rather than tips, giving away how they did it. I may have to note something here. The word hacker in this text doesn't mean what you think it does. A hacker back then was a very honorary title bestowed onto persons that were good at building programs, software, and the hacker culture has always been very inclusive and generous and actually sharing technology, knowledge, and, and software.
Anvil is back again in this episode with the love track. All right, the last word on where's dudes is from the user Ozone Pilot. Belong is the only word you will ever need to know. Where's dudes want to belong? They have been shunned by everyone and thus turn to cyberspace for acceptance. That is why they always start groups like TGW, FLT, I think that's Fairlight, USA and the like. Structure makes them happy. Where's dudes will never have a handle like Pink Daisy, because where's dudes are insecure. Only someone who is very secure with a good dose of self-esteem can stand up to the cries of fang and girly man. More likely you will find where's dudes with handles like Dr. Death, Deranged Lunatic, Hellraiser, Mad Prince, Dream Devil, The Unknown, Renegade Chemist, Terminator, or why not, to Wind Turbo. Okay, I can add some stuff there. Anyway, they like to sound badass when they can hide behind their terminals. More likely, if you were given a sample of 100 people, the person whose handle is Hellraiser is the last person you would associate with that name.
Crows, Ascent of the Cloud Eagle. Linus Valley here in Sweden disagrees with Mr. Raymond. When he wrote his rebuttal, he was part of the cracker group Triad. I will actually add a link in the description to this podcast, so please take a look there. He says things like secretive culture, no way. And he feels that um, Miss Raymond's statements are unfounded and uh, doesn't have any evidence. But I'm leaving that without much of a comment. I hope that you look at it yourself. And so, yeah.
Gerontel, in my life, my mind. And I want to say something here. I have a lot of respect for the Cracker groups, as I feel they have shown a lot of skills in technology. And also many of them had turned into demo groups if they were not to begin with. So this is not meant as disrespect, but the wares dudes, the distributors mostly, kinda took themselves a little bit too much seriously. And uh, they became kinda a little bit of a laughing stock, as they uh, w- were seen as some kind of elite people, which really were nothing more than uh, self-absorbed sysops. That's kind of my statements against this culture. But I can always see prowess in technical expertise and actually admire that.
Dr. Awesome, Aquarium 16-bit. And this is the first time that particular song is played on this station. This is DJ Demon thanking you for listening. And this episode of Flashback, Tracks from the Past, is now done for for this week. Next week, we will be back. And the next song is a really, really big favorite of mine. It's Walkman with Cliché Pa Cliché. And uh, for a story about the weird stereo of, of an Amiga module, that one specifically, go to our YouTube channel... Well, anyway, thanks for listening. Yeah.